Uh, thank you for coming to uh, Zhilong's talk today. Um, Zhilong has just submitted his thesis in this August, and he won the uh, writing fellowship. Uh, that's why he's still here. Hopefully, he will uh, write up a few more papers. So uh, Zhilong has uh, come to uh, our group to do his uh, PhD research on colloidal quantum dot solar cells in 2013. So Zhilong is one of uh, the two students, uh, Zhilong and uh, Lin Yuan over there, uh, are the first of our students who helped us uh, significantly to uh, establish the research capability on the colloidal quantum dot material and the solar cells um, from scratch. Uh, in the short uh, three, four years, they have published uh, very high quality papers and reported two um, highest efficiency on the uh, lead selenide quantum, dot solar, cell. quantum yep. dot solar cells uh, with advanced materials and advanced uh, energy materials. So I'm sure he will present this part of, of his work. And in his second part of his talk, he will uh, present some of other highlights of uh, research progress from the other members uh, sitting there. Um, I hope you will find his talk interesting. And we are happy to provide materials for you if you are uh, intending to do a collaboration work. Okay, thank you, Zhilong. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Shu Zhen, for the kind introduction, and thank you for Ziv organizing this seminar, and thanks to Rob um, getting things actually working today. So, um, and it's very nice to see um, so many people coming to this seminar, so thank you for that. And it's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, so some of you may be aware that uh, what I have been working through these few years on colloidal quantum dots. And today I would like to give you some more um, introduction to the group as well, and also uh, some details in my work. So, sorry. Yeah, so as Su Jian in introduced, so we officially started this project in about 2013. So when Gavin, Su Jian, and Rob got this ARC discovery, uh, project funding. So they are the people to thank for funding this project. So at that time, we only have two students. So Lin Yuan sitting uh, in the middle over there and myself and our group uh, sort of grow bigger and bigger since then. So now we have um, about seven people actively working in the lab. We have four students um, still doing their PhD. Uh, of course, Lin and myself just submitted our thesis in August. We have one master's student just graduated last year. And we also have uh, Long Hu who is a postdoc and I think he's sitting somewhere yeah, over there in the room. So yep, so here is a group photo of all these uh, hardworking people and uh, very smart people. So I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, most of the work here, so uh, all the members here, they partially or directly contributed to the works presented today here. All right, so today I will divide my presentation into two parts. So the first part will be on a little bit of background introduction on what actually colloidal quantum dots are. And then I will introduce why I, uh, I was interested in this uh, so-called selenide material system, uh, including uh, the fabrication of solar cells based on this system. And, and we act actually get some very nice results from the solar cells. Uh, with this material. And in the second part, I will give some more um, uh, introduction to the other works that have been conducted by the others. For example, we have some very nice work being done here for less uh, sorry, less sulfide quantum dark solar cells. We are achieving efficiency higher than 10%, uh, which is very impressive given the very easy fabrication process. We are also um, interested in making non-toxic or low toxicity materials like uh, copper indium sulfide or silver bismuth sulfide nanoparticles. So long over there particularly got some very good results for solar cells based on them. Uh, we also have a lot of material, other materials that can, we can provide. So maybe you can find something that would be useful for your project. So this is the famous NREL chart 
with the, all the efficiencies uh, of different types of solar cells here. And uh, fortunately, colloidal quantum dots is within, uh, is in this chart. So uh, the first uh, certified reported, reported certified uh, uh, efficiency was in about 2010. Uh, the efficiency was about 3%. And the improvement over these years is actually quite um, impressive, but not as far as ProSky, but I would say that's still very impressive. So now people are, we are uh, achieving a top efficiency about 13.4%, which is well also based on ProSky materials, but however, for other more commonly uh, used materials for quantum dots, we have less sulfide quantum dot solar cells achieving about 12% at the moment as well. So there is really uh, a, a promising work that have been doing, uh, go undergoing at the moment. So what are colloidal quantum dots? So why, are, why do we, we, we call them colloidal? They are essentially uh, some colloids which refer to dispersed particles in a solution. So this is exactly what they are. So on the um, left hand side here, you see this little valve with this black ink there. They are actually the colloidal quantum dot dispersions. And if you take a one drop of them and you look at them under the microscope, you start to see a very tiny particles and if you look at them closer you can actually see these little black dots which are atoms so they are very small particles which are consisted of by a uh, number tens of or hundreds of atoms so they're extremely tiny particles and i will let you know why they were called quantum dots later so when things start to go down you know to that very small size uh, very very uh, some, some very interesting things start to happen one is called the so-called scaling law which refers to the fact that the melting temperature of a material uh, goes down when the material starts to approach to a nano size. And this indicates that uh, we can actually fabricate very nice materials at room temperature if the material has a nano size. This is because uh, we have a very low melting point and the energy required to push, so to push the defects from the interior to the surface it is really, really little. So, uh, this is actually why uh, quantum dots, they are usually uh, very good materials in terms of the crystal quality, which means they also have very high uh, photoluminescence quantum yield, and there are a whole lot of um, research efforts going on in the light emitting purpose using these materials, things like display and LED. Um, this is perhaps the most well-known property for colloidal quantum dots, the so-called quantum confinement effect, and it's also, it is also why we call them quantum dots. So this refers to the fact that the band gap of the material increases when the size of the particle uh, decreases beyond the ball radius, exciton ball radius of the corresponding ball material. So as you can see uh, in this figure here, the when the particle size decreases, the absorption spectra undergoes this uh, blue shift here, which indicates the increase in band gap here. And the band gap of this quantum dot can be roughly estimated by this brush equation here. As you can see, the, higher, uh, the smaller radius it is, the higher band gap. And this is actually one of the very uh, first motivations of uh, why we want to apply quantum dots in photovoltaics because we can make multi-junction solar cells essentially based on the same material. And what we, all we need to do is to reduce or to increase the, si increase the size of the particles and to use the uh, solar spectrum more effectively. Um, this is also another very well-known property of nanoparticles. So because of the small size, they have a lot uh, more surface to volume ratio, which uh, turns out that the, the properties of the nanoparticles, they are highly dependent on the surface conditions uh, there. So I will give you some more information in the next couple of slides. So um, how do we synthesize quantum dots? We actually synthesize the quantum dots here, just, just above, just above um, in floor, uh, first floor here. So what we do is usually we have this, um, we perform this hot um, precursor injection method. Here, so what we have first is a reaction vessel with multiple necks and one end is connected to a vacuum manifold which we can uh, remove the moisture and air within the system. And then we have this thermocouple uh, in contact with one precursor so that uh, that contact uh, is in the connection with another temperature controller that can accurately control the temperature of the reaction. 
and when this um, precursor the temperature hits to a certain point, we inject another precursor. For example, lead sulfur, we have lead precursor and sulfur precursor, and we mix them together at a certain temperature. We can control the size uh, and, and, and the luminescence and, and the absorption as well. So on the right hand side, this photo here is an actual setup um, of this schematic here. So we all this we do all this in our labs. So how do we know we have made quantum dot? So uh, obviously when these precursors are mixed together, usually the, 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 the solutions undergo this color change here. So one thing here is, um, as I said, the quantum dots usually they have, have very good luminescence uh, properties. So if we are making some um, visible quantum dots, for example, the CCM lab bromide here, uh, the solution under dark, it looks like yellow, but if we put a UV torch next to it, you can start to see this green light coming out from it. And if we put another more uh, next to it, the luminescence become a lot stronger as well because of uh, more absorption. And if we look at that, this, this little this solution here under microscope, electron microscope, you can see these particles here. And if we look at them closer, we can see these uh, fringes and uh, atoms there, so which shows they have very good uh, crystal quality. So materials we can make here, there is actually a huge category of materials that we can synthesize here. Uh, things like metal trochogenide quantum dots, the lab-based, cadmium-based or zinc-based dots here. Uh, at the moment, uh, the lab-based quantum dots are the, uh, the most common material in our lab here. We also make a lot of pro-sky quantum dots uh, actually for solar cell applications as well. We are also interested in making low toxicity nanoparticles, things like copper, indium sulfide, or silver bismuth sulfide here. Uh, we have some very nice results recently, actually. We, also, we can also make a lot of different kinds of oxide nanoparticles, like anti-metal oxide, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, as well as things like silicon dioxide for uh, optical purpose. So there's a whole, whole, whole lot of um, different nanoparticles we can provide here. So now, um, Back to Lesson and I, why, why was I interested in Lesson and I? So uh, the first time when I came to USWI, I was in very interested in this so-called multiple exciton generation effect, which is the process that one, the material converts a high energy photon into two uh, lower energy electron hole pairs. So this process was found to be a lot efficient in nanostructures, things like quantum dots. And if this um, process is efficient enough, uh, the, theoretical, the theoretical efficiency of the uh, material system can suppress the, uh, the famous so-called uh, socrates quasar limit, uh, and the efficiency limit can hopefully improve it to above um, 40%. So that was one of the motivations. And this process, MEG process, was found to be very efficient in less than I quantum dots. Not uh, that they, they, their papers on uh, uh, the proof on using spectroscopies, but also there are multiple reports reported that solar cells based on this material can actually have external quantum efficiency higher than 100% in the uh, high energy uh, range. So that's uh, MEG is something that happens in less than I and something that can be extracted. Uh, in a solar cell. So during my PhD, I spent most of my time on less than I and managed to tackle a few problems uh, during, my PhD, during my PhD and uh, this works resulted in some publications here. The first problem was I, I was trying to um, uh, uh, solve the air stability problem for less than I quantum quantum dot thin films with uh, this so-called ligand uh, surface approach. I'll let you know more about that later. And the second, pro uh, second uh, topic was on, I started to make uh, less than I solar cells since then. So I managed to find a way to uh, reduce the surface recombination within this device structure. And the third problem is I, I, I spent some time um, developing a new passivation method for the material itself. So that's a material-based uh, improvement. And with this, um, Second and third work, I managed to uh, make solar cells with efficiency that actually uh, were the highest reported uh, uh, efficiency at that time. So uh, the, when I start making less than I quantum dots, I found that there is a big problem, which is that oxidation. So here on the left hand side here, uh, you can see this, this is the absorption spectra of the less than I um, ink. Uh, 
over over time. So as you can see, it has this uh, very obvious blue shift here, and this is because of the oxidation of the dots, which effectively shrink down the size of them, uh, and resulting in higher level of quantum confinements, and which is a big problem because oxidation can create a lot of defects. And I found that this problem is even more uh, severe in less than a quantum thin themes, as you can see here. This um, blue shift sort of happen uh, after hours. Uh, after exposed to air. So I was thinking, okay, can we find some way to um, improve the, the stability of them? So before that, I, uh, you, some of you may ask the question about this um, electron microscopy image there. Why are the quantum dots they having this sort of very nice hexagonal packing order here? And why are the gaps between them a sort of uniform? And, and the reason is because there's it's less than a quantum dots, and also most of the quantum dots, they are kept by some organic molecules on the surface. They arise from the synthesis themselves. Uh, they are doing two things on the surface. One is to passive the dangling bones, and the other one is to give the quantum dots the ability to be dispersed in solvent so that we can uh, use them as an ink. But you may start to ask this question, OK, if we use this material to make thin films, that doesn't look very uh, conductive, does it? So obviously not. So what we need to do for making thin film is to perform this so-called uh, ligand exchange process, so to replace this very long chain ligands to something shorter. So we can effectively reduce the barriers between the quantum dots so that we can have a better carrier transfer. So and this is. Uh, because these ligands, they happen on the surface, and if you recall that nanoparticles, they have very high surface to volume ratio, so uh, potentially this process can change a lot of properties of quantum dots. Then I was thinking, what about air stability? So um, I did some study here. So what I perform is instead of this very um, commonly used, what we call ethane dithyl, uh, organic ligand here, which was very uh, commonly used at that time. But this, this ligand there doesn't give any uh, improvement in the stability uh, to the quantum dot thin films. Mm -hmm. But I found out that the halogen atoms, uh, halogen ligands, things like chlorine, bromine, or heavier iodine, uh, after this ligand treatment, they give actually give very good uh, protection to the quantum dots, as you can see in the absorption spectra here. So after the, the halogen ligand treatments, the blue shift is effectively suppressed, uh, so that we have a lot more air-stable quantum dot thin films here. So this is sort of like a, like a bonus finding that from this work. So we found that the, um, the so-called uh, hot carriers in this nanoparticles, which is the occupation of, hot, of, of carriers at higher energy levels above the band gap of the quantum dots. <coughs> we managed to use transient absorption spectroscopy to confirm that, yes, we have these uh, relatively longer living carriers at higher energy levels. And this um, lifetime of carriers, they're also dependent on the surface ligands. So that's another very interesting scientific finding uh, from this study. OK, so after this work, I moved from making actual devices with less than I quantum dots. So just to, before going to that, I would like to give you some uh, background uh, about what was happening uh, in, uh, in about 2014. So NREL has been sort of dominating the work in the quantum dot solar cell research, or the, I think tech sergeant's group from University of Toronto. Sort of after that, I've taken over in, in terms of uh, the less than I material base, but Angra has been dominating the efficiency in less than I quantum dots for many years. And in 2014, um, as you, if you remember that uh, less than I, they, they have very, uh, they, they have very prone to oxidation. So from Angra, one of the researchers, uh, they developed this so-called cation exchange method, which they first they synthesized cadmium selenide quantum dots, and then they let it to react with uh, lead chloride. So eventually we have uh, lead selenide quantum dots with cadmium and, and, and chlorine on the surface, which uh, serve, very, serve as very good passivation to them. So these dots are very air stable. We can process, we can make solar cells with them in air, so not just in a glove box. So um, I managed to get contact with uh, the first author in this paper and travel to their lab and learn how to make these quantum dots. And since then, I tried to make the quantum dots myself and the devices as well. So um, here is how we actually make the quantum dots. It's something uh, rather different compared to uh, maybe other 
um, 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 solution processed. So the cells what I use here is what we call deep coating here. So it in so uh, there are three different solutions required for this process. The first one is obviously the, uh, of course, the quantum dot dispersion. And the second one is the what we call ligand solution to perform this ligand exchange. And we have another uh, solution for uh, rinsing or washing to remove the residues. So what I do here, I use this hand deep coating process. Uh, it's of course, I dip the substrates into the quantum dot and remove them slowly. So after that, these quantum dots with the long chain ligands, they are sitting on the, on the substrates, but these films are still very um, insulative. So after that, I did this, we did do this um, deep coating into the ligand solution to perform the ligand exchange. So after that, the quantum dots, they have a lot closer uh, packing and they, the thin films are a lot more conductive as well. So after that, uh, with some rinsing, and we repeat the entire process for multiple times until the thickness of the film uh, reached to that we required. And then we put metal contacts on them and we finish the, the cells. So it's not very hard. Uh, I want you to look at, uh, pay attention on, on this middle beaker here, this ligand solution. So again, the um, nanoparticles, they have very large surface to volume ratio. So the surface ligands, they can affect uh, air stability or hot carry effect, as I mentioned, but they can also affect the carrier density and carrier type of these quantum dot solar cells. Uh, what you can see here is a typical structure of our quantum dot solar cells. Uh, they are made on uh, transparent conductive oxides uh, with an antioxide uh, electron transport layer, so very similar to proskite. And then we have a layer of quantum dots usually treated with um, iodine-involved uh, salts, which give the uh, quantum dots uh, sort of like a minus, oh, sorry, a weak n-type doping or intrinsic property. And then we treat the, we make another few layers of quantum dots treated by another ligand, which can give them p-type uh, p-type carriers. So here on the right-hand side here is a a, a, a paper from ACS Nano demonstrating that different ligands can give uh, actually probably opposite um, carrier types and densities in the quantum dot thin films. So what we have here in the structure is essentially a PIN junction here. That's how we make dots. But um, one problem in less than I quantum dot solar cells, actually I think most of the quantum dot solar cells is the surface recombination in the devices, but that happens to be uh, a lot more severe in, in, in less than I. And then I was thinking to, okay, um, these interfaces here between the quantum dot and the, and, and the metal, I was finding, I was trying to look for some way that can uh, suppress the surface recombination. So, what I did is, uh, at that time, we start making this cesium lab bromide uh, larger band gap uh, pro sky material here. So what I was thinking to put a larger band gap material here so to see if we can have some kind of carrier blocking effect. Uh, it turns out to me now it's quite a naive idea, but uh, somehow it turns out it worked, actually. So at that time, I was struggling with efficiencies slightly lower than 5%. So after this treatment, somehow the efficiency improved dramatically to above seven uh, percent. And if you remember that the previous record from NREL was six point five percent, at that point we actually suppressed that efficiency. Uh, we first time uh, have this seven percent uh, quantum dot solar cell here. Uh, the good thing is uh, because of solution process uh, solar cells, you know people working on ProSky, we know that the, the reproducibility is always a big problem, but we found out these uh, devices were reasonably uh, good. They're doing good in reproducibility. So with this ProSky treatment or back layer here, we have consistently higher open circuit voltage, a fuel factor, and eventually the power conversion efficiencies as well. So um, we did some more characterizations on what's going on with these devices. These are just part of it. So the first thing we found that is we confirmed that the pro skies, because they are very, um, they are very sensitive materials, they can sort of degrade, maybe they can degrade after deposited on the less than I think films. But we confirmed that the pro sky can they actually survive after this process. Uh, so the pro sky is definitely doing something over there. 
And we found out the dark current in these devices is actually one order of magnitude lower when the pro sky back layer is there. So we're thinking that must be a suppressed recombination uh, uh, at that interfaces where the pro sky are introduced. So the first, that, uh, then I went back to the idea, is there some kind of electron blocking effect? So if it is, then the p-type quantum dot layer may be less necessary. So I, uh, I have this structure. So without the p-type layer instead, I just put pure pro sky on. But it turns out the cell didn't work very well. So we concluded that this um, suppress of carrier recombination here is not because of electron blocking effect, but instead some, some kind of passivation. So at that time, the exact mechanism that led to this uh, passivation was not very clear, but we decided to report these uh, results uh, because we have this, this highest record in last year. So we managed to publish these results in advanced energy materials. So after that, I, I keep thinking about what was the actual um, uh, reason for this improvement in the solar cells. Is, it, is this some kind of reaction going on between the less solenoid and the pro sky quantum dots? And then I did this article, very nice paper came across and, and I found that something very interesting in pro sky can happen. So, um, so for example, if you make pure cesium lab bromide or iodide or chloride quantum dots, and then if you uh, disperse that in solution, and if you mix them together, they, they don't just exist like independently by themselves. Instead, they actually react with each other, So, which means the uh, halogens within the pro sky nanoparticles, they are very flexible. So when you mix them, they become an alloy, uh, like cesium lead bromide iodide or cesium lead chloride iodide, uh, chloride bromide. So this, you may recall this scaling of nanoparticles, the melting point uh, for these nanoparticles is very low. So uh, the rearrangement of uh, the structure or the atoms within these materials, uh, the energy required is very low. So these things can happen actually in room temperature. And we did a little test in our lab here. So we have the bromide pro sky here and iodide pro sky here. After we mix them together, you have this sort of green, yellowish color. And we measured the PR, we found that that was a single peak, uh, material with a single peak. So that's something very interesting. Then I begin to, th to, to think that, um, okay, this can happen in quantum dot, uh, less than I, sorry, pro sky and pro sky quantum dots. But does this happen in less than, between less than I and pro sky quantum dots? So I, uh, sorry, um, if you, I would like to remind you that the less than I quantum dots are air stable because of the surface chlorine passivation. So is it possible that the uh, pro sky is sort of replacing the chlorine surface passivation by the bromine uh, from them? So uh, which which uh, it turns out the bromine and iodine, the heavier halogens tends to be better for passivation to less selenide and less sulfide quantum dots as well because of the stronger bonding between the lead and the halogens. So I performed this experiment here. So um, basically I just drop a pro CCM lab bromide pro sky into less selenide quantum dots. So this is the samples under the UV torch. So because of less selenide is infrared, so we can't see it, but we can clearly see this uh, pro sky, the, the luminescence from the pro sky. So initially, that the pro sky maintains green color, but after a little bit of shaking, the color sort of turns into aqua color and eventually stop at a, a blue color. So we and we then find out that the this um, sorry this final color of this material or the pro sky is sort of dependent on how much uh, uh, pro sky and less than that you put into the mixture. So you have a little bit of more of pro sky, it, 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 the final color is closer to its original color, but if you have just a little bit of pro sky, they all turn to something uh, invisible or something purple. So which means the pro sky material, they become something with a higher band gap, uh, which turns out it's very possible they are cesium lab bromide chloride or pure cesium lab bromide uh, chloride. And we found out that we measure the PR of this samples and find out, okay, this pro sky uh, materials has a single peak. So it's not uh, because the, the color change was not because of the reabsorption of the black dots here. And uh, we look at, look at the samples under TEM, we find out these particles can coexist at the same time. But that was only the, well, the pro sky had this color change. What about less than I? Because less than I is what we want to, we want to 
apply in photovoltaics here. And then we, we took a energy dispersion spectroscopy EDS um, measurement here. We found out, okay, yes, these cubic uh, pro sky here, they, they have growing and bromine here. So this uh, anion exchange did happen. And then we also see these uh, spherical less than nine quantum dogs, uh, they have chlorine as well as uh, bromine signals coming out from them. So they actually have this uh, hybrid passivation, which uh, theoretically should be better. And similar things happen between the cesium lead iodide and lead sulfur at the less than as well. Uh, the only difference is after this treatment, the cesium lead iodide couldn't uh, survive, should have survived because uh, because of this large difference between the ionic radius between iodine and chlorine, so they cannot just have this exchange directly. But never mind, we found out that the lesson and I also can grab part of the um, some of these iodines coming out from the pro sky, and it turns out we have another hybrid preservation, so chlorine and iodine in this uh, in this treatment. So after that, we managed to do some chemical um, processes to separate the uh, lacinonite and the away from the pro sky uh, nanoparticles. And after we, we found that the there's not much difference in the absorption spectra and the PL, the position of the PL in the nanoparticles, which means the lacinonite they maintain their crystal structure, they maintain their size, and then. We measure the so-called uh, PL quantum U, photoluminescence quantum U, which is defined as uh, the ratio between the number of photons emitted from the quantum dots and the number of photons being absorbed by the quantum dots. So um, this is an indication of uh, the quality of the quantum dots because uh, because if we have less defect, we have less non-radiative recombination, so that it turns out to be a more luminescent material. And we find out that with uh, a certain uh, op appropriate amount of proskites mixing with the lesson and I, we can improve the uh, photoluminescence quantum yield. So we have a better material uh, after this treatment. So okay, now we have this better lesson and I quantum dots. Of course, we want to make solar cells with them, which is what I did. So um, it turns out that this work work quite well and as expected. Uh, so we managed to improve the efficiency to the previous previously reported 7.2 percent to um, 8.2 percent, so one percent absolute in uh, improvement uh, when after the when, when we use the dots treated with pro sky. So uh, again, again, so between the previous uh, paper and, and, and this result here, there were no uh, other uh, efficiencies reported, I mean, higher efficiencies reported in less than quantum dot solar cells. So this was actually, again, the highest reported efficiency at that time. And just for your interest, our cells didn't, didn't have any hysteresis effects uh, here. Okay, so this is another very interesting thing that um, our less than I quantum dot solar cells uh, are actually very air stable if we use the dots treated with the pro sky. So in the red dots here, these are the pricing or the control dots without the pro sky treatment. As you can see, the efficiencies sort of drop from just above 7% to lower than 6% within only a week. But if we use dots, Treat it with, with the pro sky, we, we can actually see this dog, th these devices are very air stable, so they can retain at least 95% of their initial efficiency, even um, after stored in ambient conditions for about two months and uh, without any encapsulations. So they are very air stable here. Yes, we did some more characterizations on these devices. We found out that the uh, devices with the pro sky treatment consistently had lower dark current. So that's another indication for suppressing uh, recombinations within these devices. We found out that uh, the devices were also very uh, reproducible. So these ones were treated with the pro sky, they consistently have higher VOC. And uh, with the proper treatment, we can uh, have an average efficiency above 7.8 percent. So uh, that was uh, quite a quite a big improvement compared to our previous result. Okay, so this is a rather very complicated measurement, but uh, what I want you to I would like you to focus is this um, colorful 
you know, images here, this uh, red, uh, yellowish signal here. So on the left hand side is a quantum dot without a process treatment, and on the right hand side, uh, are taken from a thin film made with with dots with the process treatment. So this red or yellowish signal here, it's an indication of um, uh, 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 surface defects, if you want. So it's what we call um, photo-induced absorption in transient uh, spectroscopy here. So this signal has a has a is dependent uh, to the to the surface defects on the quantum dot. So if you have more significant signal, you have more um, defects. But as we can see here, after the pro treatment, this signal is significantly suppressed, which is another indication for uh, uh, the the the. the dogs have better passivation here. Yes, so um, then we, this year we decided to report these results here. So we managed to get these results published in advanced materials. And um, again, now we still have this highest uh, reporting efficiency for this specific type of quantum dark solar cells, uh, about 8.2% this year. Okay, so that was, uh, my PhD work. In the following, I would like to give some more updates on the other works that has been done within the other group by other members, some very nice works. We obviously, we have a lot of um, works going on with the less sulfide quantum dot solar cells. We, are, we have people optimizing the n-type electron um, transport layer. We have people working on uh, doping of these quantum dots to improve the electron hole extraction. Uh, within the devices. We also have people working on one, what we call one-step deposition, um, which refers to, uh, uh, because the, usually for, for the deposition of quantum dots, we have this layer by layer uh, uh, process, which is sort of time consuming, but with this one-step deposition, it's a little bit like Pro's Guide. So we save a lot of time and materials. And because of the tunable band gap, <coughs> sorry, because of the tunable band gap, we can have quantum dot, quantum dot uh, tandem cells as well. And we can also have quantum dot and uh, material space and, and other cell space on other materials. I think Ling has done ve some very nice work with Jonathan uh, using spectral splitting. So having this um, uh, pro solar cell as the top cell and the less sulfide cells as the bottom cell. We also we are also making a lot of uh, pro quantum dots here, and we. We are trying to make this into solar cells as well. We are also interested in developing uh, low toxicity materials, uh, something like silver bismuth sulfide that uh, we talk about that something from Long's work, which is very nice. We also have some copper indium sulfide work uh, going on in the project. So this work was conducted by Long Hu, which is sitting there. So um, he had this idea about to, uh, on making better um, cadmium sulfide electron transport layers for, uh, for not just in, in quantum dot solar cells, but um, more generally um, applications in other thin film solar cells. So cadmium sulfide uh, layers are usually uh, uh, more commonly made by, by uh, chemical bath deposition, which requires a lot of um, chemicals and a large volume of uh, chemicals. So what he developed, he developed some sojal material uh, with the cadmium and sulfur, and sulfur uh, inside, and he, he found out he can deposit these sojals by spin coating, or spray coating, or deep coating, and then resulting in this very nice and uniform uh, cadmium sulfide layer. He found out that there's, there's some um, optical layer, optical number of, uh, sorry, optimal number of layers, and uh, an annealing time of these uh, layers, and then he used less sulfide uh, as the testing platform for this uh, cadmium sulfide. So that was, that, that was a work, uh, I think the efficiency he achieved last year, at that time we didn't have 10%, so we're short of having the 8% cells. So he found out that, uh, well, the 8% was based on the metal, and, uh, metal oxide, so zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. And he found out with um, good control, he can also make 8% uh, solar cells with this cadmium sulfide uh, layer, which I think the highest previous reporting efficiency was around 5%. So that's a very huge improvement. So obviously he found that the, this sojal can work and it worked very well indeed. Um, I think the, pro, the, 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 uh, the, the undergoing mechanism is uh, he found out that he can actually control the number of defects in the 
cadmium sulfide and also by the by these different annealing conditions uh, he could control the electron transport efficiency from the lead sulfide to the cadmium sulfide as well and as I said he only used the lead sulfide as a testing platform um, for this cadmium sulfide layers and it turns out at that time we had very comparable efficiencies compared to other uh, metal oxide um, anti-transport layers. So we're also looking at maybe we can apply these materials in other thin film solar cells like CIGS or uh, cadmium terra or CJTSSE. So he also managed to get these uh, results published in advanced functional materials uh, just recently. Okay, um, this is also another work conducted by Long. So uh, this is a, a, a idea on so, so, okay, yes, this is a doping idea for the less sulfide quantum dots. So what we do here is we know that we can, sorry, if you recall this, um, this structure here, we have a PIN junction within the solar cell, but the, we found out that the P-type material, the carrier, in the carrier density in this material is not optimized. So what he did, he was trying to, he was trying to introduce silver doping into this quantum dots for making this P-type layer. And uh, that happened this year. So at this year we had the baseline efficiency uh, just above 9%. And with this silver doping uh, treatment, he managed to impro improve the efficiency to above 10%. So uh, we are actually very close to the world record for less sulfide quantum dot solar cells as well. So um, I think Suja may have the ambitious target of you know, um, getting the maybe having the world record for this type of solar cell as well next year. So, yep, uh, and this work has also been submitted for publication. Um, there's an, another work on um, low toxicity materials that I would like to share to you. So uh, last year, this uh, group from uh, ICFO in Spain reported uh, the synthesis of silver bismuth sulfide nanoparticles. Uh, they didn't have any quantum confinement, so they're essentially just nano, small nanoparticles. Uh, they managed to uh, use this uh, colloid, colloidal nanoparticles to make solar cells out of them. So very impressively, they got uh, the first try, they got about 6.3%, I think. Yes, here six point three percent with this uh, material, and the very very impressive thing is the absorber layer, the silver bismuth sulfide layer, is only thirty five nanometers here, which um, <laughs> may be a little bit unbelievable, but anyway, this material is obviously working and. Um, and it has a very low toxicity because the bismuth has, has a lot lower toxicity compared to cadmium or lead. Uh, but the thing he, here is they have to use this uh, very expensive polymer as the P-type transport layer, what, what we call, uh, I think that was PTB7. Yes, the PTB7 polymer here, which is very expensive. So long conducted some work to improve the uh, to, 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 try to try to find a way that he can apply some cheaper polymers to replace this expensive polymer, uh, specifically P3HT. So what he did is he did some improvement in the synthesis uh, of these nanoparticles. So he managed to find a way that he can improve the solubility of the silver uh, precursors. And eventually he got a better stoichiometry in the nanoparticles. And after that, he tried to use the P3HT polymer, and he managed to achieve efficiency over 4%, while the previously uh, reported um, efficiency was lower than 4%. So it's something very, uh, it's, it's only um, still short of low, lower efficiency, but given that this, this material only appeared in the research community for only two years, so we think this material is also, is also very promising in, in terms of their efficiency and, and because of their low toxicity as well. So this work is now under, the manuscript is under preparation. Okay, so in conclusion, so I think I have shown you that um, a lot of things today. So I give you, I've given you a general introduction of our group here. So hopefully you know what we can do here, what we can synthesize, what materials we can provide uh, here. And I hopefully, 
uh, you, you, you now know that the making solar cells out of these nanoparticles, they are actually not hard. It's very simple, scalable solution-based process. And there's obviously this potential for low-cost solar cells. Uh, in terms of the efficiencies, uh, for less cellular quantum dot solar cells, we actually have the leading efficiency in the research field above 8% uh, this year. For less sulfide quantum dot solar cells, we have devices above 10%, so which is very close to the world record again, and very impressive given the very simple um, fabrication process. We also have this low toxicity uh, materials, silver bismuth sulfide and CRS nanoparticles. We can actually make uh, working devices um, out of these materials, and the efficiencies uh, tends to be uh, actually, uh, actually quite decent. So with that, I think I, 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 I sorry, I, um, I think I can sort of answer the very first question or the title of this presentation. Can we fabricate high efficiency solar cells based on colloidal quantum dots? I think the answer is definitely yes, um, because we, we, we only have a very small group here, and I, I think uh, that the processes are not that hard. There are, there are still a lot of things that uh, can be improved. and. Um, at the, mo at the moment, we're having, we're having very um, leading efficiencies in the field at the moment. So I think, yes, we can definitely work on this uh, to get high efficiency and low cost sales as well. So uh, the materials that I mentioned today are just a fraction of the material category that we can provide in, in our group. So if you are interested in uh, particular, particular materials that you want to apply them in the applications, um, of your research, you are welcome, I think, to approach the Su Juan or Rob or Gavin to see whether we have the nanoparticles already there, ready for you to use, or if you want to have some, want to synthesize some particles, but you don't know how to do it, or you can, you're always welcome to talk to us because we have the skill sets, we can make uh, materials relatively easily with the similar um, process. So I think with that, I would like to conclude the presentation. Thank you. I think we'll have a couple, couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. <coughs> yes? Well, quite complicated topic, but quite easy to follow. Nice talk, Jilong. Thank you. Uh, my question is, you mentioned uh, lead sulfide has a very uh, interesting pro pro uh, property that one photon can generate two electron hole, uh, electron hole pairs. Yes, the lesser. Yes, uh, the lesser. Lesser. Okay, yeah, the yeah. lesser. And uh, so have you demonstrated that in your solar cells, uh, over 100% internal quantum efficiency? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, not yet. So at the moment, we are still chasing the sort of um, baseline of um, uh, actually, the, the baseline of less than I quantum not solar cells. It turns out the VOC of these devices uh, quite low, or we call the VOC losses, the difference between the band gap and the actual VOC. So what happens is, is this multiple exciton generation requires the material to have very low band gap that, so that they can effectively absorb all the photons from the solar spectrum. But it turns out if we use lower band gap materials, the VOC of these devices are very low, very, very low. So we did, some we, we, we did see some improvement in the current, but uh, in terms of the VOC, because of VOC, the overall efficiency was too low. So um, we, we, we haven't looked at that yet, but definitely I think yes, the next step is we, we are trying to make lower band gap quantum dots just to increase the size and to make devices that hopefully we can see multiple exciton generation and actually um, extra current coming out from that mechanism there. Yeah, thank you. Yes? Yeah, thanks Jilong. Um, a question about stability. Mm -hmm. uh, you showed some results with um, a certain number of days uh, where it was quite stable. But you also talk about the quantum dots having a very low melting point. Yes. So I'm wondering, have there been any tests on stability during high temperature? Uh, at the moment, no. So um, not, not quite. But I think the uh, melting point of quantum dots 
thing films is rather quite complicated here because, uh, well, of course, they have got very small size, so the melting point tends to be quite low, but they're also kept by a lot of um, surface ligands here. So the, the thing film is actually quite complicated here. So um, uh, I think I think I don't think any people have ever done, conducted any stability on the on the um, uh, thermal stability of, of these thin films because the whole system is very uh, complicated. I think, but I think definitely uh, we, we we can go for that direction. And the other thing is for the cells, we, we t it turns out before the measurement we usually perform some annealing process of these cells, but. Uh, so definitely they can still survive under temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. So above that, um, my guess is uh, it can, yes, it can still sort of uh, maintain their structure up to 150, but going beyond that may be a little bit problem. So, yeah. Other questions? Well, thank you, Dan, for a great talk. Thank you.